Right, okay, so welcome everyone to the first installment of this new series of the Cyprus Centre at Westminster on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the UK Cypriot community. My name is Petros Karatares and I am a senior lecturer in linguistics at the University of Westminster and I'm also um, uh, one of the two co-directors of the Cyprus Centre at Westminster alongside uh, my colleague Alicia Chrysostomo and our patron uh, John uh, Haralambos. Uh, we are delighted to be kicking off uh, this uh, series of symposia, of lunchtime symposia on the impact of the pandemic on the community in the UK and um, today we're going to be focusing on the topic of health um, as this is first and foremost uh, a health crisis and we have a um, star-studded lineup of speakers across from across the um, uh, the many aspects of the activity of the community who will be uh, sharing with us their thoughts and perspectives on uh, today's topic. Uh, so um, before we uh, we start today uh, we are joined, uh, we're honoured and delighted to be joined uh, uh, this afternoon um, by His Excellency the High Commissioner of Cyprus in the UK, uh, Mr. Andreas Kakouris, and I would like to uh, invite the Ambassador, the High Commissioner, uh, to say a few words to open up this uh, series of lunchtime symposia. Thank you, uh, Pedro. Uh, distinguished panelists, uh, dear friends, uh, I would like to welcome you to this uh, timely panel discussion, which aims to shed light on the impact of the COVID pandemic on the Cypriot diaspora in the UK. The sad reality is that no one has been unaffected, either directly or having lost a loved one. Statistics indicate that the Cypriot community in the UK has experienced disproportionate infection and mortality rates. Equally, the physical, mental and financial repercussions and scars on so many have been heart-wrenching to witness. For more than a year now, the entire world has been suffering the consequences of the pandemic. In addition, the repercussions of the measures taken to contain the spread of the pandemic resulted in unprecedented effects on our daily lives, our livelihoods, our contacts, our social interactions. Extraordinary, yet pressing dilemmas. Lives versus livelihoods, mental health versus possible transmission of a deadly virus. Our community has responded remarkably to the pandemic. Various organizations, including the National Federation of Cypriots, the Cyprus Medical Society UK, and the Cyprus Community Center, have all tried to alleviate the human suffering by providing medical services and other forms of care and assistance. Food packages being delivered by volunteers, meals on wheels for the elderly who relied on the community center in North London throughout this period, all provided comfort at a time of uncertainty and hardship, and in many cases, loneliness. Similarly, the community newspapers and radio station have played their part as well, and we are immensely indebted to them all. Today, what do we all want more than anything else? A return to normality in safety. Now that we can see light at the end of the tunnel, it is important to identify these instances of altruism, community building, and ethical and moral support. Special thanks go to the distinguished members of the panel who are gathered on this online platform today to share their own experiences of the pandemic, as well as research results, statistics, and data in the field of their expertise. Namely, I would like to thank Dr. Linda Babadoulos, Dr. Athena Mavru, Dr. Hussein Jakal, Michael Yagumi, and Lorna Vasiliadi. Last but not least, very special thanks to Dr. George Gassianos, UK National Immunization Lead for the Royal College of General Practitioners, who has kindly made himself available to respond to any queries regarding the vaccination program of the UK government. Together with George, we're looking at how we can spread the word to the community regarding the necessity to be vaccinated and address concerns, whether real or perceived. I would like to take this opportunity to invite all members of our community to go and get the jab as soon as it is offered to them. 
By all accounts, it is our path to a safer future and has already shown that it is indeed working. Today's panel is the first of a series of lunchtime symposia addressing the COVID effects on our community, which the Cypress High Commission is co-organizing with the Cypress Center at the University of Westminster. In fact, the first university event that I attended after my arrival in the UK was with the Cypress Centre. Seems so long ago now. And the Cypress Centre has been actively involved in promoting and engaging on Cypress-related issues since 1988, through conferences, symposia, professoral uh, lectures, seminars, exhibitions and book launches in London, Cyprus and Greece. The Centre has organised conferences and seminars each with the name of addressing current concerns or areas of interest to Cyprus and the UK Cypriot community. And themes covered to date include that of identity, archaeology, culture, heritage, maritime traditions and tourism, to mention a few. A great many of these events have been undertaken in partnership with the High Commission. And as High Commissioner, I'm most pleased to see that this robust relationship is going from strength to strength and that COVID has not dampened the enthusiasm to explore areas and avenues of cooperation. Let me take this opportunity to thank Dr. Alicia Chrysostomo, Dr. Petros Garatzereas, and Professor John Haralambos from the Cyprus Centre, as well as my cultural counsellor, Dr. Marios Psaras. This productive collaboration between the High Commission and the Cyprus Centre, today's initiative being a prime example allows for a truly expanded discussion, inclusive of the wider separate diaspora in the UK. Finally, I'm confident that today's panel discussion, indeed I'm certain the other two panel discussions that will follow in the coming weeks, will be interesting, insightful and helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you for your most kind words and for setting the frame um, so, so perfectly, uh, you've done part of my job as I was going to introduce the, our panelists today, uh, so I can take that off, uh, off my list. Um, so, uh, thank you for that, and in the interest of time, and um, knowing that we only have one hour for the event, I'd like now to invite our panelists to, um, to make their contributions. I'll briefly introduce each of the, uh, of the persons that are with us today, and I'd like to invite um, our participants um, to uh, use the chat function of our platform to um, address any questions. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat and we'll be um, uh, curating the questions uh, to our panelists at the end of um, the contributions. So, um, uh, first, uh, this first speaker for today is um, Dr. Linda Vavopoulos. Uh, who is a chartered psychologist and associate fellow of the British Psychological Society and author and broadcaster. Having built an outstanding reputation in both academia and broadcasting, uh, Dr. Papadopoulos is an active researcher with a prolific publication record. Her work has been published in some of the most highly regarded academic journals and has informed government policy, most notably a highly acclaimed independent review for the Home Office on the effects of sexualization on young people. Her work on the impact on, of social media on mental and cognitive health has received recognition by both policymakers and stakeholders, and she has sat on advisory boards of major corporations advising on a variety of issues. She was recently awarded the prestigious EFCOM Fellowship Award in recognition of her outstanding and prolific academic publication record and for being an exceptional communicator as both an author and broadcaster. Dr. Papadopoulos will explore the impact of the pandemic from a psychological point, uh, point of view and the effect it has had on both the community and the individual. Dr. Papadopoulos, over to you. You're on mute, so if you'd like to unmute yourself. Hey, there we go. Um, thank you so much. Um, it's, it's great to be here. I always, um, I always really value the chance to, to kind of speak to, to, to our community like this. And I think I, like everyone else, has been profoundly affected by the impact that it's had. Um, I know people that suffered with COVID. I know people that, that lost family members with COVID. It, it, it has been very tough. But um, I guess what I want to what I want to do today, what I think is kind of um, important, is to kind of speak just from a psychological perspective about why 
um, pandemics affect us psychologically, what it is unique about COVID, and then also just to leave you very briefly with a few things that we can do. I know I only have a few minutes, so um, I, I guess to begin to say is that um, we're beginning to see research, right, regarding the, the psychological effects, and, and frankly, we know that, um, unsurprisingly, the impact of COVID has been profound. Now, the reason that psychologists tend to be concerned about the long-term impact of COVID is because we have insights from other pandemics and national emergencies. For example, we know that strategies like quarantining that are necessary to, to minimize viral spread can have negative psychological effects um, including, you know, sort of on the serious level, you know, things like PTSD, but things like, you know, depression, insomnia. We know the job loss and financial struggles during sort of generally global economic downturns have been associated with not just short term, but also very long lasting declines in mental health and well being. Again, we look historically at the adverse mental health effects of disasters. We know that they tend to impact people a lot more and, in fact, last a lot longer than the physical health effects, right? So um, back with the SARS global outbreak in 2003, we know it was associated with about a 30% increase in suicides. Um, similarly, we should suggest um, mental health problems, particularly PTSD, remained an issue for people who lost homes during the Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. Um, and then beyond that, we have perhaps the more, um, uh, the more professional aspects of it, right? So we know that all of us that have continued working are reporting a huge incidence in emotional exhaustion. Two out of three people are saying they've experienced some sort of depressive episode, 44% saying that their overall mental health has declined since they've been working from home. And, you know, even reports of Zoom fatigue, you know, I mean, it's, brilliant that we can do this like this, but I can, you know, speak as someone who, who speaks a lot for a living. It's such a shame not to be able to see people's faces to bounce off of them. You know, so much of what's happened with Zoom again is that all of our communication is very purposeful, right? We connect when we have something to say. A lot of the buffers that we get emotionally, psychologically is with non-purposeful communication. It's bumping into someone, you know, in the break room. It's, you know, it's seeing someone in the hallway, it's speaking when you have nothing really that important to speak about. So I think all of these things have affected us. Now, I've done this job for a long time, and if I had to pick one thing that makes people good at life, I think that thing would be adaptability, right? The, the ability to, to respond and to manage sort of stressful life experiences. And when we look at research in this area, we tend to find that sort of the three things that correlate with our ability to adapt are what we call the three C's, commitment, control, and challenge. So I just want to elaborate briefly on these. Um, the commitment attitude basically leads people to strive to be involved in ongoing events rather than feeling kind of isolated, right? It involves maintaining a sense of purpose and meaning in life. Now, we find that people who are, are able to do this, who have this hardiness, it's because they're, they have um, a sense of belonging and a sense of purpose. And I think one of the things that, that COVID did is it blindsided a lot of us. That sense of belonging and purpose was gone. It meant that, you know, whether it was because we lost our jobs, whether it was because we, we lost our ability to kind of uh, feed our families or connect with our families, whatever it was, that, that kind of wobble happened. And I think it really was one of the, the, the big factors that we saw in kind of that decline. So, it's, it's critical, I think, in terms of resilience that we speak about how we thrive, how we find a sense of meaning, how we're able to look at a bigger picture when it comes to change and consciously commit to trying new things, um, to pushing through rather than, than doing what's, I think, oftentimes the most comfortable thing to do, which is sort of closing down, which is leaving. Because the fact of the matter is that, you know, situations like COVID cause a huge amount of anxiety. Now, the way that most of us deal with anxiety is by avoidance. When something makes us anxious, we avoid. The more we avoid, the smaller our world becomes. And the smaller our world becomes, we become comfortable within that smallness, right? And I think speaking about, for example, even the vaccines and what's going on, the, the, you know, the idea that this is even seen as risky speaks to the fact that we've avoided any sense of risk and we've inflated risk in our minds. I think that it's critical we come back to that. 
The second thing um, I want to speak about is, again, control. One of the things that um, having an attitude of control does is it means we no longer see ourselves as kind of, you know, leaves in the wind, as helpless victims, but rather we, we see ourselves as having volition over our lives. We're not at the mercy of stressors. Um, so as a group, emotionally hardy people, they, they don't avoid challenges, they accept them and they overwork to, to kind of master them. Um, even, even when true mastery is impossible, right? So, you know, if someone loses their job, they may not be able to get their job, but we know that the people that tend to thrive are the people that say, okay, well, I can fix up my CV. I can reach out to my network. I can, you know, I can look at what I was doing before and say, I can, I can supplement my skill set. So again, it's that mindset of being able to have that internal locus of control that will improve your chances of, of being able to, to engage. And it's kind of being careful you don't engage in learned helplessness, right? This idea that no matter what happens, there's nothing that I can do. Um, the final attitude is what we call the challenge attitude. And this leads people to see stress, whether positive or negative, as opportunities for new learning. There's a um, I'm a big fan of the work of um, Professor Carol Dweck. She speaks about kind of this open mindset and the notion that, um, you know, if you're open to getting things wrong, if you're open to trying stuff and failing, then actually not only do you survive, but you thrive, right? You become a stress-hardy person because you, you view a challenge as potentially something you can overcome once you understand it properly. Um, and, and it's a really interesting kind of life view. So instead of viewing um, something bad that happens as this insurmountable problem, this difficulty that you'll never be able to get over as, you know, the gods and the world being against you, you view it as a puzzle to be solved. And this habit of, of looking at stress and challenge as a puzzle allows you to kind of put yourself in a more positive mind frame to look at it. So look, I think in many ways as a psychologist, if I was going to develop, you know, something to, you know, increase people's anxiety, I would have developed COVID. It's the holy trilogy of anxiety. It's novel, it's a genuine threat, and it's uncertain. And, you know, we know novelty is a problem because we're conditioned to focus heavily on new threats. That's the way our brain works. So any cause for alarm um, is amplified in our minds, right? Um, in extreme cases, in fact, it can lead to something called the crowding effect, where there's no room for anything in our mind but the thing we're worried about. You know, it was a genuine threat. And because we live in a media-drenched world, um, we have so many more explicit descriptions of what's going on. So risk seems especially painful, disturbing, and, and you know, we tend to overestimate it. And finally, it's uncertain, right? The less we know about a threat, the more we fear and we overestimate its impact. But look, this isn't March 2020. Thankfully, we're over a year on and you know we do have a vaccine, we do have access to it, and we have seen that it's taking effect. And I think it's time that our discussions move from defining a problem to looking at solutions. And, um, and I think ultimately, it's through being able to not just kind of change our own mindset, but to kind of positively infect the mindsets of those around us to look at this as a challenge to increase locus of control to kind of tolerate the uncertainty but focus on the stuff that we can control that will allow us to get through this um i'm looking forward to your questions thanks very much thank you so much linda that was um, an excellent contribution about the, the the impact of the pandemic on our everyday lives i really like the the idea of the purposefulness of interactions now, and I'm really looking forward to our purpose-less interactions <laughs> in, in the near future. Uh, so our next speaker is um, Athena Mavro uh, from the Cyprus um, Medical Society. Um, Athena is an internal medicine trainee at Imperial NHS Trust. Uh, she obtained her degree, her medical degree from St. George's University of London Medical School with distinction and since then has continued her clinical training at various hospitals in London. Um, she worked on COVID wards during the last year and will focus on the medical aspect of COVID, such as the nature of the symptoms, the severity, as well as the long-term implications of COVID-19 and how they affected um, our community. Athena, um, can you share your screen? Excellent. So we can see. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. 
Um, so as you said, um, I've been working um, for the last year um, on uh, COVID wards during the pandemic, both in normal wards and on high dependency unit and the intensive care unit. And thank you for giving me the opportunity today to, to talk about my experiences um, during the pandemic. Um, firstly, I wanted to go through a timeline um, of, um, um, of um, the pandemic. Um, so back in December 2019, um, there was a cluster of patients um, with this unexplained viral pneumonia um, in China. Um, the cause um, of their pneumonia being a new coronavirus, which was termed SARS-CoV-2. So the infection um, was declared as a pandemic by the World Health um, Organization on March 11th. And in, in the United Kingdom, from the beginning of the pandemic up until now, um, we've recorded around 4.4 million cases. Um, and sadly, 150,000 um, 150, um, patients died from coronavirus. So the struggle in the NHS, um, from our point of view, um, as doctors working in the NHS, was apparent from mid-March um, 2020. Um, at that point, we knew very little of um, the symptoms and the infectivity um, of, pa of patients. And soon patients that were um, positive of COVID-19 were sitting in A&E amongst other vulnerable adults. Um, in March, um, in the, on the 23rd of March 2020, the UK went into lockdown. And since then, we started seeing the numbers decreasing. Um, so the second wave started late in 2020, and it was marked by the appearance of this British variant, um, which um, was dominant during that period. Um, so the number of patients admitted during the second wave was significantly higher, and the average age of the patients uh, was much um, was um, the patients were much younger and less likely to have comorbidities. Um, however, what we were seeing was very different because um, at that point we had specific treatments um, for, um, for, this, for these patients, such as steroids, um, an easily accessible medication that um, was, studies have shown that it had, a ben it had a benefit in reducing mortality in patients that um, were in the hospital and they were in need of oxygen um, from COVID-19. Um, so I wanted also to touch up on the symptoms of, um, of COVID-19. I'm sure you all know um, the typical symptoms, but just to, to briefly go through the phases. So um, when someone um, is infected with COVID-19, they usually go through a period of two to 11 days where they um, they could be asymptomatic. Um, and then only 30% of them will go on to develop symptoms, the typical symptoms that you know, like fever, um, difficulty in breathing uh, and cough, and for most, around 50% will go on to develop severe um, COVID and uh, require admission in the hospital, and they might end up having respiratory failure, so their lungs failing to work appropriately, the kidneys fail to work appropriately, um, and they require high dependency care or um, intensive um, care. Um, how long do the symptoms usually last? So for most people, um, they last less than 11 days to 14 days. However, one in 50 patients um, have prolonged symptoms that last for more than 12 weeks. And this is what we call the long COVID, um, the long COVID syndrome. And um, um, patients that suffer from long COVID syndrome usually have um, prolonged respiratory symptoms, difficulty in breathing, they've got heart problems, but they also have um, significant uh, problems like anxiety and depression, which could be associated because of um, their admission in the hospital or just because of the disease. They also can have neurological symptoms like um, confusion that can um, prolong um, and memory problems. So how was the Cypriot community affected by COVID-19? Um, obviously, most of my data were from the National Federation and the um, and newspaper Barikiagi. Um, so around six, um, 640 um, Cypriots in the UK um, um, have died from coronavirus, um, and, this, um, and, and those numbers were mainly in London. Um, so 3% of the total numbers of deaths during coronavirus in London were Cypriots, which is a number disproportionately higher than the population of Cypriots in London. So why was this the case, and um, why were Cypriots strongly affected by the UK? 
um, by, by COVID. Um, so there were several studies um, um, done um, um, looking into the risk factors um, of patients uh, for hospitalization and death from COVID-19. And um, I'm sure you've all heard about um, um, the um, specific ethnicities like Black and um, Asians and ethnic minorities that were more affected um, compared to other ethnicities. So um, I've just put some um, of the risk factors um, on the screen. Um, and we could use this to relate to the Cypriot population um, and comorbidities including um, age, um, high blood pressure, diabetes, um, and heart problems that were shown to be associated with higher risk of hospitalization. Um, and this could are fairly common in the Cypriot population, especially the elderly patients. Um, then lifestyle factors like um, and body weight, smoking, and most importantly, cultural habits that um, have been associated with um, risk um, with the risk of um, severe COVID, um, and um, which I mean, like strong family bonds, which means which meant staying in contact um, with family and friends um, before the lockdown or even during lockdown, um, that could e increase our risk of um, catching COVID and then. Um, the risk of hospitalization. And then there's some socioeconomic factors that can relate to the Cypriot population. And the most important one is the multi-generation households, um, which clearly has an impact on viral transmission, um, especially for the elderly population. Um, so um, lastly, I wanted to um, talk about um, the COVID-19 helpline. So in the beginning of the first wave, um, the Cyprus High Commission and the National Federation of Cyprus um, of Cyprus in the UK brought together um, a group of doctors uh, based in the UK, um, some of which are now um, founding members of the Cyprus Medical Society. Um, and this group of doctors um, um, were um, offered to give medical advice and help to um, and help to the Cypriot um, to the Cyprus in the UK. So since then, the helpline um, has been in operation um, throughout the pandemic, and um, they have received more than 500 emails and phone calls from Cypriots seeking advice um, regarding COVID-19, as well as general um, health issues, um, questions about um, how to get tested, vaccination, and how to repatriate back to Cyprus. Um, for us clinicians, actually, this was the only tool we had to appreciate the impact of COVID-19 on the Cypriot population, um, which was significant um, from the medical um, perspective. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's very insightful and it's good to see the data, but it's also sad to hear about the numbers and I think it might be good at some point in the future to, um, to do some research on the specific factors of the Cypriot community that contributed to that um, disproportionate um, effect of COVID. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Athena. Um, mm -hmm. So our next speaker is um, uh, Dr. Uh, Hussein uh, Chakal from um, uh, University, uh, Kiel University. He's an assistant professor at the University of Kiel. Um, Hussein obtained um, a doctorate degree in social psychology from the University of Oxford before joining the School of Psychology at Kiel as a lecturer in psychology. Uh, he has a particular passion for policy-oriented research on extremely disadvantaged communities in the least access regions. And today he will explore how COVID has influenced minority groups in general and specifically the Cypriot diaspora in the UK from an academic viewpoint. Hussein, uh, the floor is yours. You are on mute. So, yes, excellent. Thank you, um, Petros, and thank you, uh, Linda and um, uh, uh, Athene, if I'm getting you, uh, your name right, um, for providing some substance uh, to some of the uh, things that I would like to discuss uh, with you um, today. Um, um, straight to the topic, early on we learn about the, uh, um, the higher prevalence of COVID-related deaths among the Cypriot community in the UK. And this obviously uh, motivated people to come up with their own explanations, such as whether um, Cypriots uh, uh, have a genetic uh, disorder that, might, uh, that is making them 
um, particularly prone to the virus. The truth of the matter is that in public health and in um, allied sciences and social sciences, uh, looking at a uh, higher prevalence of certain uh, pathological uh, occurrences in communities is more through a life course approach, which includes looking at uh, in, uh, individuals, all life uh, stages, starting from pre-birth, going through early years, working age, older ages, and how individuals uh, and communities acquire uh, um, certain positive and negative effects to their health through these, their stages. So um, this includes, of course, uh, as I said, um, all through um, the uh, the prenatal and afterwards and the family environment, which I'm not going to go into detail, and also include uh, the communities they live in, the uh, geographical area with the local services, and also country level of factors, which collectively contribute uh, to um, physical and mental health uh, uh, among different communities, across different communities or individuals. Um, so um, just to, uh, as a reminder, in the UK, we now all know that uh, the mortality risk from COVID-19 among ethnic minorities is particularly higher compared to white British patients. And um, an additional detail also is that uh, black and Asian staff, uh, NHS staff, uh, only represent 21% uh, of the NHS workforce, but uh, from uh, the COVID, uh, they suffer proportionately uh, high, at higher levels from uh, uh, COVID uh, compared to the other uh, uh, ethnicities among the uh, health and social care workers in the UK. So this is a really interesting and uh, telling. Um, one uh, another detail: uh, research is now emerging to show this uh, these differences across uh, different ethnicities. Um, without boring you with statistical details, the, the red uh, columns show the increase in terms of mental distress uh, across uh, gender, men and women, and uh, um, uh, minorities uh, versus uh, white British. You can see that the, uh, the group least affected from uh, uh, COVID pandemic in terms of mental stress, mental uh, uh, health and well-being is white British uh, men. Um, unpacking these again uh, uh, into further uh, uh, um, details, we also see that here um, that the highest, uh, the, the, the most affected groups are uh, British, uh, Indi uh, Bangladeshi, Indian and Pakistani women compared to all groups. And then here we see that white British men as the least affected uh, group. So uh, why is it then? Well, um, Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, um, that is the scientific, highest scientific body of uh, researchers in the UK, uh, that advise uh, the British government, uh, um, has uh, some explanation uh, with, uh, for this. According to uh, SAGE, um, this, uh, the higher prevalence rates among ethnicities are, are due to certain factors, which include socioeconomic deprivation, um, uh, involvement in high contact risk occupations, um, geographical location, household size and composition as uh, discussed previously, and other uh, underlying uh, health uh, issues. To open this up, why? Well, we now know that most ethnic minority groups are more likely to live in urban and deprived areas and within close proximity of each other. And uh, we also know that uh, um, they live in, uh, 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 compared to the uh, white British, uh, uh, they live in overcrowded houses. And uh, most of the time, these houses are multi-generational. Uh, 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 multi um, and then um, because they, they concentrate, at, uh, most of the ethnic communities concentrate in certain areas, uh, they have uh, reduced access to healthcare. Sometimes this is just due to the reduced provision of these services, or sometimes uh, because they live in their own communities due to other factors such as language barriers that the uh, um, communication about pandemic, how to, pre how to uh, protect oneself doesn't really reach to these people. And finally, uh, Ethnic minorities also uh, are concentrated in certain occupations, uh, 
uh, they, they tend to work outside of their home um, during in, uh, lockdowns and they're uh, more likely to use public transportation to travel to work compared to uh, white British. So take them together. Um, this suggests that uh, um, it's not actually the genetics, but it's the ethnic inequalities that are manifesting themselves as either exposure to uh, infection and health risks, uh, risks, including mortality, and also exposure to loss of income as a result of the occupational uh, risks. And uh, in terms of Cypriots, as uh, 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 we don't yet know um, much about it, but my uh, speculation is that uh, um, household composition, that the multi-generational household and crowded household uh, um, uh, composition, occupational risks and uh, reduced access to healthcare and language barriers, as well as age and also pre-existing uh, health issues uh, have contributed to the higher prevalence of COVID-related deaths among uh, Cypriots in the UK. Thank you. Thank you, Hussein. Uh, that's excellent. So I think your contribution makes the point uh, again that we need more research into the, the impact, uh, the specific impact on the community. And there are a couple of questions in the chat that we will return to during the round table. Um, I, I think that the message is coming out already is this, that there needs to be a closer look at, at the community um, to see which of these range of factors um, mm -hmm. are more relevant. Um, so, um, Mr. Lambridis, I will um, wait for questions and, uh, until the end, if that's okay with you. So, I'd like to move on to our next uh, speaker today, um, who is uh, Michael Yakumi from um, uh, the Parikeki uh, newspaper. Uh, Michael is an author and a journalist uh, and has reported on the effects of the pandemic in the community across the last year. Uh, and he will be sharing his findings and thoughts as to why the community appears to be disproportionately uh, affected by the virus from uh, a journalistic viewpoint. Um, I think we're all very interested in, um, in your take, Michael. So uh, if you'd like to turn on your mic and camera. Um, so we're looking forward to hearing what you have to share with us today. Can you see me? Yes. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, for me, hey, Michael, obviously, hey, Michael, we, you can't, we can't see you now, can only hear you. Can you see me now? Uh, no, I can. Can you? Now, yes. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for giving me the opportunity to speak today. For, for me, like the rest of you, we've all lost lo loved ones, friends, relations, etc. For me, I was very close with the COVID-19 within the community because I work for the Badagiyaki newspaper, we get death announcements every week, maybe five or six. Then all of a sudden we were getting about 10, then it increased to 20. And um, we started thinking, this is very serious, is it about COVID? Then people would, uh, some of the death announcements were coming in COVID related. So we decided to do some research because we thought this is getting serious and we must make the community aware of what's going on within our community, the numbers, to make them know that this is very serious and be conscious of it. So we started ringing local um, funeral directors, local hospitals, uh, churches, and then we started um, moving outside London as well. We started doing research outside London with hospitals, the churches and local community leaders, community centres within London and outside London. And we started doing the figures and they were going up and up and up. And that, where we were getting 10 announced death announcements, we're now getting like 50 a week. And we, we've done our figures and like someone mentioned before, we came to... Um, the figures up to last couple of months were 630 Cypriots, 582 in London, 48 outside, and 311 were Greek Cypriots, 270 Turkey Cypriots, and there was two cases of Maronite Cypriots. And what concerned me most was that a lot of them were within the families. We had cases of 12 cases of husband and wives. We had about five cases of father and sons, and there was one case 
and in Western Supermare where a whole family had got COVID-19 and three of them died. So it was very, very serious. And um, we, we noticed that it was mainly over 70s that were dying, but we did have quite a few under 60. We had a case of one but a man at 51, another one, two brothers at 55 and 56. So it was very close to home. And um, I'm glad as a newspaper, we made the community aware to take the precautions and make sure they're serious about it. We're making, giving them notice how to prepare themselves to be safe from COVID-19. We were running adverts continuously within the paper. And it, it was very, very difficult times. People were ringing us up and asking us, as this person died and this person, you know, they were very concerned. But um, the reason for, we don't know, like yourselves, we're looking for the reason why so many Cypriots died. I mean, pre-pandemic, the first one, obviously we had big congregations. We had weddings, religious events, um, christenings, uh, Cypriots going to football matches. Um, it was a lot of us were congregating in a, in a very close to each other in big um, events. And also, like it was mentioned before, people were telling us maybe as Cypriots we live um, a lot of us in the same household. There could be like five or six in the house, or maybe even more. Yes, in some cases you have the grandparents. You have the mother and father and the kids and maybe even grandchildren. And then there another reasoning people gave us, is it because of lack of vitamin D? Because uh, obviously us Cypriots and Asians and Caribbeans and Africans, we all come from a country where we have a lot of vitamin D because of the sunlight. You know, everyone was giving reasons. But for me as a person, I was very sad to see what went on the last year and uh, Hopefully now with the vaccine, we started to look, we started to see improvement and hopefully that's the way it's going to be. We're going to progress and maybe we'll see a new world again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. This is really great. It's, it's great to hear about how you first sort of noticed this rise in, in death announcements. And I think we're all grateful for the research that Parikye Ki did in terms of getting those numbers and showing that there is something going on um, in, in the community. Um, thank, you, thank you so much. We'll come back with questions. Uh, so um, our last but not least uh, of the speakers today, um, Lorna Vasiliadi, uh, who is a mental health and heritage researcher um, Lorna's background is uh, a career in journalism for national newspapers and magazines. Lorna has written uh, three books for Psychologies magazine. Uh, she recently conducted a groundbreaking survey among the Greek Orthodox community in the UK investigating heritage and mental health. Um, this is for an interim study between her um, MSc in Creative Arts and Mental Health and her forthcoming PhD at the University of Queen Mary, University of London. Um, and today she will be introducing aspects of this research as they relate to uh, COVID-19. I'm going to share uh, Lorna's slides in a second. So, Lorna. Thank you. Hearing. Thank yes. you, Pedros. And I must also say a big thank you to Pedros, who very generously gave his time when I was designing the survey. Um, and when I had the idea, it was just before the pandemic. I think had I known what we were going to go through, I might not have chosen to do the survey at that time. But really interesting things came out of this. Um, the reason uh, the, the Greek Orthodox uh, community were surveyed is because many of the attitudes to mental health derive from the church and a lot of the academic research uh, focuses on this aspect. So I wanted to look at how are things for us living in the UK? Um, I think the, I, I, I thought I'd show you a quick snapshot of how people were feeling when they completed the survey, which was in the midst of the pandemic. 
One might have expected the figures regarding how people felt during the pandemic to be more negative. Um, but because this was a self-selecting survey, um, the demographic that is excluded is also the demographic that was probably most affected uh, by the pandemic, and that's the over 70s and the lower um, socioeconomic um, demographics. Um, there was a huge response. Um, I, I wasn't just pleased with the, the number of the people participating, but the fact that people gave very generously in their comments. There were over, there were 56 questions and there were over 400 comments. Uh, and around uh, a third contributed to really expressing how they felt about the pandemic. And the main um, uh, themes that came through echo what all the speakers have said today. Um, I would just add one thing um, that hasn't been mentioned that came out through the survey, and that was a, an identity confusion. Is it better for the pandemic in the UK? Is it better in Cyprus? Who is handling it more? Uh, a lot of these concerns came up. Now I've picked, because I'm aware that we have a very short time, just three of the 73 comments about the pandemic, which I feel illustrate the themes that came from the entire survey. Now this person says, as we are a social community, COVID has probably had a huge impact on our mental health. And what the survey shows loud and clear in all the figures, and I hope to have another opportunity to discuss the statistical side, is that we Cypriots need this connection to our heritage. This connection boosts our mental health. It boosts our resilience. It makes us feel good. So the pandemic uh, brought up two things. We supported each other because that's inbuilt in us, but we, we also missed that lack of connection. Um, not being able to travel to Cyprus. One of the crucial differences that came up between the Greeks who participated in the survey and the, the Cypriots, um, the Cypriots constituted 70% of the participants, is that for us Cypriots, identity is a big issue. Whereas the Greeks are very sure of their identity, for those of us who were born in this country, uh, for the Cypriots who've been here for decades, uh, we really need to visit Cyprus for so many reasons. We need to process our identity through visiting Cyprus. So that was a big loss. And this final comment for me, and you have to forgive me because I teach uh, creative nonfiction writing, so I'm a little bit of a geek when it comes to analyzing. For me, this final comment really sums up so much about our community and our attitude to mental health. Um, the beginning is a universal story. Uh, this lady is a widow and it's a modern life. She lives alone. Her children and grandchildren are not near her. And yet she starts off saying, my experience has been good. And then we get the, the picture, the sad picture of loneliness and great stress. And why did she survive it? It's not just the interaction, the neighbors, but it is specifically the people from her community. And I'm just going to add here that there's a, a big interest in progressive psychiatrists in how ethnic communities deal 
with mental health um, and, and what ethnic communities can teach the wider British communities. Um, so these neighbors provided practical help. They provided emotional help. And then they had coffee meetings in the back gardens. And I think every one of us here can imagine these ladies having their coffee meetings. Um, I love, I love that she says that helped tremendously to, oh, I skipped by mistake. Ah! Um, that helped tremendously to see and talk. And she puts in brackets, gossip, in your language with friends. Um, this is something I really hope we can develop with Bedros, the significance of language, hearing our dialect, speaking our dialect, having a connection with people we, we, we feel familiar with. For a few hours, she says, stress and loneliness was on hold. Um, we know from mental health studies that the brain needs time to rewire. If it's constantly stressed, it can't de-stress. And for us, that connection to community helps our brains become resilient. Uh, now we go and walk together for exercise with our masks on. It's, it's beautiful. So for me, this comment really sums up how as a community, we, we deal with problems. We come together, we are resilient. We find resilience through connection. Uh, and in terms of a, a conclusion, we need to see our friends, our family, we need all of these uh, events, uh, which also include bi-communal events uh, that was included in the survey. All of these events connected to Cyprus are very, very valuable for our mental health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorna. That was... Um... Excellent. Um, I really like the comments about language. No one will be surprised about. Uh, <laughs> um, so before we open the um, the floor to questions uh, and in being mindful of the time, I would like to invite um, our guest panelist, Dr. George Casianos, uh, to um, say a few words. Um, jo Dr. George Casianos is has been the national immunization lead for the Royal College of General Practitioners since 1996, of which he's a fellow. He chairs the Pan-European Group on Influenza Raise, Raise Awareness on Influenza Strategies in Europe, and is board director of the European Working Group on Influenza. Uh, Dr. Casianos is the author of Immunization, Childhood and Travel Health. He has edited a number of medical books and has lectured worldwide in over 30 um, countries. Um, so, um, Dr. Kasianos, what is your take on today's um, contributions? Uh, thank you, Petrus. Uh, really amazing details we have had here, uh, Donna and uh, Linda, uh, developing on how people think, but also the data that Athena and Hussein actually um, um, share with us. Uh, I think, just to keep it very uh, short, the common denominator is the health of our community. We really need to improve the health of our community because that way our community will be able to withstand so much better um, uh, all these uh, in, uh, problems that a pandemic actually causes. And health, of course, I do mean physical as well as mental. And the important thing uh, that we need to take into consideration is that to have a healthy immune system and a healthy body, uh, there are things that we must not do or do. Uh, do not smoke, eat a diet that is high in fruit and vegetables, exercise regularly, maintain a healthy weight. If you drink, drink in moderation, uh, get adequate sleep, seven hours minimum, eight hours even better. Minimize stress, uh, take steps to avoid infection, like washing your hands frequently, cooking meat thoroughly, take all the vaccines that are actually recommended. These are basic things that we need to really promote in our community so that the, the health it improves. And I'm pleased that uh, Michael Yacomi mentioned vitamin D. 
Dinos, Missouri uh, at, at uh, Cypriot at Wexham Park Hospital did a study in the hospital last uh, April. And what they found is that patients who were admitted with low vitamin D did badly. They needed ventilators and so on. But if you give them vitamin D in the hospital, they don't improve. So the message is that we need to have a, a good vitamin D level in the community. And the Public Health England recommendation is that if you are Caucasian with very white skin, in autumn and winter, you take 10 micrograms of vitamin D daily. But if your skin is slightly dark like the Mediterranean or you're black, you take the vitamin D throughout the year, unless you're exposing a lot yourself to sunshine. So these are basic things that we need to promote in our community and uh, so that we can get a much healthier community than what we have now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kassianos. And I think this ties in really well with one of the comments that we received by um, by the Mostras, who very much welcomed the Cypriot Medical Society work and the announcement on COVID. Um, uh, Mario says that the announcements were published in the local church and there was a doctor there to talk about the situation uh, after one of the services. So there's a lot more that needs to be done and there's a lot more that needs to be done in terms of these messages getting out there in ways that um, uh, the Cypriot Medical Society has done in a, in a very successful way so far. So. Um, uh, Athena, please let's keep this going, is the, is the message from yeah. the community. Fine, our best. Uh, there are also a few questions about um, uh, the factors that contributed to the disproportionate effect of COVID on the Cypriot community. So, um, Vespa Papa Christodoulou asks if we know which of these risk factors that were talked about uh, might be more relevant, and Anna Kurbulu Iqbal uh, asks specifically about numbers of Cypriots under 60 who may have passed away and whether that was higher than the average. Do we know or do we need to find out? I think, um, I think the message is that we need more research on the community. Yeah. I think the message is that we need more um, a, a close, closer look in an appropriate way. Uh, and we have the work for, by Paddy Keke in terms of, with evidence that the the the, um, the effect was disproportionate, uh, and now we have to explain it. And for that, we need more um, uh, more research. Um, so are there any other questions, comments? Yes, Mr. Alambriti. Yeah, you can turn off your your mic. I don't know if you can, yeah, we can hear you. Hello, Mr. Steven Alambritis. Maybe, maybe not. Um, was that another common contribution, thoughts? Okay, then if not, then um, I think we might be able to bring uh, today's lunchtime symposium to a close. Bang on time at 1.30. I think we should all congratulate, congratulate ourselves for that. Um, we said uh, we'd be done by half past one, and it is half past one, and we're done. I'd like to thank all the contributors today for setting this, uh, uh, the stage so excellently and raising the bar so high for the next uh, to uh, symposia. Um, uh, oh, there's a question from uh, Gay Mavromatis. Gay Good. Oh no, there was not a question. Okay, so um, thanks for coming in. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, we have two more of those. Um, the next one will be on the 10th of June and uh, will be themed around culture. And the third symposium will be on the 1st of July, uh, themed around the next generation of Cypriots in the UK and the impact of the pandemic on, on them. We're going to be um, 
uh, in the same place, uh, same uh, time on the 10th of June and the 1st of July. I uh, would be delighted if you would like to join us again. If you'd like to bring your friends, bring your friends, let your people know that this is a nice and fun uh, lunchtime uh, conversation, but also one that is looking towards um, implementing some positive change for the future um, of our community. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, and hopefully um, see you again very soon. Goodbye from me and the Cyprus, uh, Cyprus Centre at Westminster and the High Commission um, of Cyprus in the UK. Have a good Thank afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. All the best.